This morning we have got Don Williams from the Institute of Sports and Science, I think you might me. Um, I believe he's videoing our program this morning, so that if you want to check back on anything, you'll be able to. But anyway, I'll hand over to Don because um, probably if I tell you something, it might not be right. So I'll just let Don do all the work, and he's going to uh, help us which we all suffer from probably. On the morning, we all get up, dress up and show up. We don't tell people, you know, what little problems we have. So today we'll learn some remedies for our secrets. Thank you. There you are, Don. Good morning. Okay. Hello, thanks for the welcome. I hope that I do an interesting presentation for you guys today. Um, I don't often lecture to I don't want to say lay people, but in a non-technical world. So I lecture at university, the medical school, and I lecture at master's level for rehabilitation, specifically. So writing a presentation for people who aren't necessarily medically trained is somewhat more difficult because I need to stay out of technical terms. So if I ask anything or say anything that's confusing or doesn't make sense, don't be afraid to interrupt and get me to clarify what I was meaning, um, just in case I've gotten any language wrong for you guys. So, so when Anne asked me to do a presentation for you guys, I tried to work out the sort of things that would probably be interesting to you as a group. So I've tried to cover the musculoskeletal conditions that affect the retiree in Australia. So our goals for the day, I've got a little bit of stuff on demographics and population in Australia to start with, just to sort of give you an idea of where we're at. I'll give you an understanding of the common injuries and ailments that affect the retiree, the things that we tend to deal with. And then we'll tell you a little bit about what we do and a little bit about some of the things that you can probably do to work on issues at home. So who am I? Uh, I started off, my whole goal when I was in my teenage years was professional sport. I wanted to do triathlon and that was pretty much my whole goal in life. I got run over by a car when I was uh, almost 18, so I had extensive lumbar surgery. So I went through a lot of rehab and I have a fair concept on what people go through when they have major injuries. I went on from there, did human movement studies at the University of Queensland. I then did a master's in chiropractic at Macquarie in Uni uh, University in Sydney. I then did sports medicine and then I did a rehab master's. So I spend most of my time now working in rehabilitation. So I don't do classic chiropractic work very much. So all those details, I'll actually do a, a PDF of what we've done today and we can send that out so you can read all that stuff later on. Who, who are we? Uh, our clinic, Institute of Sports and Spines, we're a multidisciplinary clinic and we do a lot of musculoskeletal complaints. We don't really do anything outside of that. So we have chiropractors, exercise physiologists, acupuncturists, massage therapists, physios, and mainly what we do is knees, hips, shoulders and back complaints. Questions, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions during the presentation, don't be afraid to stick your hand up and interrupt me. Is that clear? Can you guys see that? well from there. So this is our population in Australia. We've currently got 23 million people and it's projected to get to 36 to 48 million by 2061. So we're expanding our population group. Currently the median age is 37.3 and once again that's expected to rise over the next uh, 40 years. That's essentially baby boomers and the generation beyond who are actually going to push that, that uh, population age growth. So at the moment ba baby boomers are pretty much the biggest subgroup and what's going to happen in the next few years is that your age group is going to uh, take a, big and, a bigger and bigger uh, share of the actual population density. So we have an aging population which most people are probably aware of that anyway. So currently we have 3.2 million people aged 65 or over in our population, which is about 40% of the population in that age group. This is projected to rise to be 18.5%, sorry, I've got a stat wrong there, 18.5% by 2031 and 23.5% by 2061. And the biggest thing is the really extended age group that as we go through uh, advances in health, then our lifespan is increasing. And the current newborns, it's projected that their probable life expectancy will be close to 100. 
So we're living longer and longer and unfortunately it doesn't stop us from getting musculoskeletal complaints. So knees, hips, shoulders and backs are still failing. And it means people are living with these conditions for longer and longer periods of time. And the other interesting thing, and this is more specifically relevant to you guys, is the people who are going to retirement are not necessarily well funded. And when you poll people in their working years and ask them what they think they'll have in retirement, whether they'll be self-funded or not, about 80% of the population believe that they will be self-funded in retirement. But it's actually a much smaller proportion than, than that that are. So that's kind of you guys. And most of the people here will be in cohort four. And so when you look at cohort one, this is the young generation of workers. And most of those guys think they're going to be self-funded, which is partly driven by what we're being educated as a group of people and then partly they just believe that they're going to be financially better off than they actually are. So I put that in there just for a bit of interest for you guys to just give you a bit of a level playing field of where we're at. So diseases, this is basically the numbers of diseases in society or the number of cases of disease and the biggest group by far are arthritis and musculoskeletal complaints. So even though stroke, heart disease might be big killers, they're not actually the most prevalent diseases. And for a lot of cases, they're actually not the most expensive diseases either. So some of the stats are a couple of years old, but in 2004, 2005, 31% of the population have musculoskeletal complaints. This is things that they're reporting or they're showing up at doctor surgeries and clinics and things to actually have managed. 15% had arthritis, of which 51% had osteoarthritis and 16% had rheumatoid arthritis. You may know that arthritis is much more common in women than in men. So men tend to have heart attacks and strokes and women tend to have arthritis and joint pain. Osteoarthritis, to differentiate, there's two different major subcategories of arthritis. We have osteoarthritis, which is degenerative, and then rheumatoid arthritis, which is inflammatory. So when you look at all, look at all the other arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, there's a whole bunch of different things and they fit into one of those two broad categories. Osteoarthritis is more common and osteoarthritis is more common in elderly or, or in advancing age because we traumatise our joints throughout our life and so they degenerate more. Rheumatoid arthritis is more commonly uh, hereditary. So if your parents or mother particularly had rheumatoid arthritis, your likelihood of having rheumatoid arthritis is much greater. And it's generally the more aggressive and it is the arthritis that will often cause horrific pain, lots of deformity and, and often major joint replacements. Although osteoarthritis drives joint replacement surgery anyway. As I mentioned before, sorry? Can you have both? Yes, definitely. In fact, the older you get, the more likelihood is that you'll have osteoarthritis. So it's suggested that once you hit 80 years of age, you're going to have a degree of de degenerative change in the joints. Now that may be labelled as osteoarthritis or it may not. So it's really a, a classification. So once someone starts to show some degenerative change, you could quite strongly argue that that's arthritic change. But that, that's going to happen anyway. So rheumatoid is an autoimmune disorder and the joints basically erode, they have holes or punched out lesions in the joints and so it's, it, yeah, they definitely <coughs> happen together. 15% have back pain. This is a bit of a weird stat actually. It's suggested that 80% of society will get back pain at some point in their lives and on any given year about 60% of the population will have a debilitating back complaint that will have them off work for at least one day. Osteo uh, osteoporosis is not actually that prevalent, so only about 3% have osteo osteoporosis which is going to have a major impact on them. And once again, much more female orientated than male, so about 5 to 1 to 1 ratio. So these are conditions by age, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, arthritis in general tend to advance more with age. Back pain actually hits a peak and then starts to drop off. So when you get into the 80, 85 year age group, their complaint or the, the new onset of back pain reduces. The other interesting thing is arthritis and back pain both are more prevalent in lower socioeconomic groups. And this is suggested partly to be due to smoking, drinking and increased manual labour in those groups of people. But it's quite a strong link. So if you are 
more resources in a better socioeconomic group, you tend to have less back and arthritis problems. And the other major thing, and this is one of the things I'll talk about later, is lack of physical exercise is a major predisposing factor to every disease, disease in society. Stroke, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity is considered a disease now. Back pain, which is also considered a disease now, all of them have lack of physical exercise as a major predisposing factor. There's a group in the 90s that did a study in the States and they had all these people that were in nursing homes. So you're talking full care facilities and these people were not able to live in their own or under their own care or in low care facilities. They got all the people into a, a study program where they did exercise regularly every day and they followed them over a six to 12 month period. Something like 30% of the people in the nursing home moved out in, into low care or self-managed facilities. About 15% stayed in high care but improved their quality of life and then they had a, a death rate of about 5%. Obviously that sounds pretty horrific but when you're in a high care facility then that's unfortunately just something that occurs. So I'm going to nag everyone today about doing more physical exercise if you're not doing that regularly. So what costs us money? Cardiovascular disease is the most expensive thing in our country at the moment. And then oral health. You wouldn't think that looking after your teeth costs more than anything else, but it actually does. Mental disorders, they're third highest, and unfortunately they're increasing. So in the next 20 years, the, the suggestion of the amount of uh, psychological and psychiatric complaints in the country will increase by around about 20%, which is a kind of horrific stats. And some people wonder whether that's the younger people are just softer and they're complaining more or whether it's becoming more aware of these conditions. And then fourth on the list is musculoskeletal injuries. So that actually beats cancer. And most of the cases that cost us the money are the, the smaller proportion of the overall cases. So it's basically saying five or ten percent of the cases cost us all the money. And they're the chronic cases that need extensive surgery and extensive management. In 2001, 2002, most of these stats came off the ABS site, so if you're looking for any reinforcement of these stats, go for a search. $4.6 billion annually was spent in 2001, 2002 on musculoskeletal complaints, which is 9.6% of our total health expenditure. Although it's expensive, no one really dies from musculoskeletal complaints, they just suffer. So only 1% of deaths are attributed to knee pain and shoulder pain and hip pain, so on and so forth. And only 3% contribute to death. And so you're thinking things like a knee failed, so as a result they fell down a set of stairs and hemorrhaged and died. So only 3% in that context. So which joints suffer the most? Knees are the worst, then hips, then shoulders. We would deal in our clinic with probably one shoulder to 10 to 20 hips and probably around about the same for knees and once again women suffer more than men so when you're looking at total hip replacements total, total knee replacements it's much higher for women in arthritis once again so that contributes to the knees and hips failing but even when you look at um, hip versus knee replacements once again knees are higher here but we've got some stats on women so knee replacements women are in green uh, men are in blue and women are beating men on all fronts. So this is a joint. All joints in the body basically have two bony ends, they're covered by articular cartilage. The joint is full of fluid with a bag around it. In essence that's the basics of it. And when you see arthritic, uh, arthritic changes and degenerative changes, you're looking at that articular cartilage degenerating and as a result you start to have the, the bones rub against each other and that's what causes most of the pain. Now there's a whole bunch of structures in the joints that can cause pain, so you have ligaments and tendons, in the knees you have menisci, they can all generate pain but they're not normally the reasons that people have joint replacements. I'm not going to talk much about osteoporosis, essentially because in our clinic and most clinics Osteo osteoporosis is managed by doing as much load-bearing exercises as you can and then making sure your dietary intake and everything is fine but it's not something you necessarily treat on a musculoskeletal level. But I just thought I'd put this little picture and diagram up to show you 
what osteoporosis actually does to the bone. So, so if you think of bone as a sponge, it's really dense, osteoporosis eats out sections of that sponge. So you end up with a much, uh, there's, there's less volume in the sponge and those little bits that are in between are a little bit more fragile. So when you see osteoporotic fractures, which often contribute to back pain, when you don't have the density with the picture on the right, then it's more prone to failure and fracture, and then you tend to see the vertebral bodies collapsing. And that's why, once again, in women more than men, you'll see this posture in old age, because the vertebral bodies are squashing at the front, because that's where more of the spongy bone is. And at the back of the spine, you've got more solid bone with the little bridges and different elements and processes that poke out. They don't degenerate as much. So most osteoporotic fractures are at the front of the spine. So this is a hip joint. I've got some pictures of some open hip surgery and things. So if anyone feels squeamish, let me know and I'll skip past them pretty quickly. <laughs> this is a hip. This is the, the cartilage that I was saying is at the end of the bones. And this is stuff that degenerates. So this is where we get all the problems from. And then the hip is a ball and socket joint. So I've got some models and things, and if you want to have a play with some hips and things and knees later, come down and sure to help you out as much as I can. So it's a ball and a socket. And so the ball can degenerate or the socket can degenerate. Now, in the hip, there's a little bag or a labrum that comes out from the edge of that socket that deepens it to make it more stable. We see tears in those. So we see tears of the bag and we see disruptions of that articular cartilage. So they're the main things that people come in for. In osteoporosis, you'll often see people fracture this part of the joint. So they're hip fractures, or the archetypical hip fracture. Once again, way more common in women than men. And the unfortunate thing is hip fractures, as we get older, tend to have much more serious consequences. So hip fractures in the plus 75 age group, it's close to 20% don't come out of hospital, which is a fairly frightening statistic really, and a lot of that's actually because of comorbidity factors, death, because uh, you get little uh, clots and bits of fat that come out of the fracture and they travel into the vascular system and that's, that's a common reason that hips are such a big concern in the hospital system because of the comorbidity, death, etc., from them. So, some of these gross images, that's what a real hip looks like. So, what we looked at before, that grey ball is this, and that's the socket. So, we've got a ligament coming out. This is the labrum, or that little bag that I said that extends it. That labrum represents the most misdiagnosis that we see in our practice across every single musculoskeletal injury. So, anterior hip pain, once again, females more than males but people tear this structure fairly regularly and it gets misdiagnosed. So we'll often see people, they come in, they've had the problem for two years, ongoing issues, can't get it resolved, they've had physio, chiro, massage, acupuncture, the whole spectrum, and they really rarely respond to conservative management. So we have a really great relationship with a couple of the hip surgeons and knee surgeons in Brisbane. We send them off, get that trimmed up, and they're back to normal pretty smartly. This is the sort of area that we tend to interface with. So we're looking at muscular control, how people move the joints. And the reason I put this picture and the next picture up is just to show you how many muscles are around the hip. Our bodies are amazingly complex. We can do some really quite freakish things and no one really tends to regard how complex the anatomy is around the areas. So people come in, they've got hip pain, that's all they're concerned about. What we often look at is, what are the muscles around that area doing? Do they have weaknesses? Do they have imbalances? And that tends to be what we drive with rehab, is making sure people have balance in their movement when they, when they leave us. That's the front of the leg. This is basically the bony, uh, a picture of the, the bony skeleton of the hips. The reason that women tend to get more problems than males is essentially because of the wider hips it means that they have a greater angle of their legs. So wide hips, it's called a Q angle, and so that puts more strain on the hips, and that seems to be the reason why they get more injuries. This is what a normal hip x-ray looks like, and this isn't really probably a clear enough image to show you, but this is an MR of the hip, and so you can see the ball and socket, same sort of profile, in this one actually has one of those labrum tears I was talking about. So if you can see that little white triangle, 
in there, that's a labrum tear. So that's the sort of things we look for on MRs to go, that's why you've got the ongoing problem. If we had better resolution, you'd probably be able to see that a little bit more clearly. This is a degenerative hip that's getting ready for surgery. So on the left side of the screen, you can see a fairly normal hip. On the right side, we see a fairly abnormal hip. These are all images that come from patients that we deal with. This is what happens. Remember before I said about the articular cartilage all wears away? And then you have all this rough surface that's left. And when that's grinding backwards and forwards over the top of itself, it obviously crunches, grinds, causes you a lot of pain. That's why they do replacements. So this one, the red in there, that little pinky sort of border, is the inflamed bone. So the bone gets inflamed, but it can't get away. It's not like in a muscle or under the skin where the, the inflammation can spread. In the bone, it feels compressed. That's why degenerative hips and knees have that deep aching pain. This is a couple of hip replacements for you. The one on the left isn't really used anymore. Sometimes the wires snap and so then they have to go back in and do another op. The, the new ones are more like the ones on the right. They're actually a faster replacement, they're less traumatic and the recovery is much faster. I haven't seen one of these in practice as a new replacement for a number of years now, probably five years since I've seen one of those come in. The stats on the bottom are what I said before about hip fractures and their, uh, their fatality rate. They're often linked to pneumonia and that's because of the fat globules that come out of the bone. But the, the hip bone or the, the top of the leg bone, the femur, is really fatty. There's a lot of fat in it. And those fat globules, when they go to the lungs, often will cause infection which leads to pneumonia. And that's that and pulmonary embolism are the two reasons that people get, get uh, major complications from hip fractures. I've got a couple of hip videos. I don't know if they'll come up on this projector or not. Is this interesting, statistic-wise, for you guys? This is unfortunately me on the right, but the guy on the left, left has just come in from hip surgery. Can you all see the limp on him? When we're doing post-op rehab, we do a lot of video work with people. So we have them on a treadmill, you can see the screen in the background. So they can see themselves walking, so they can see the limp. Because the most important thing when you see post-op rehab is that they get rid of the limp as quickly as possible. You see people, they come in, they have a hip complaint or a knee complaint, and hips walk like this post-op, where they throw the hip around the circle. And then knees clump, they do this one. We, we want to get those problems out because if you do this all the time, you're going to get back pain from it. So we get people come in and they've got headaches and it's because they had hip surgery and they decided they weren't going to do any rehab and they've done this for six months. And then all the time their neck's getting sore from it. Yeah. So this guy is actually three and a half weeks post-op when that video was taken. So we're fairly brutal. If you come and see us, we normally will see the knees and hips around about a week post-op and you're on the treadmill at a week. They don't necessarily like it, but the faster you get them moving, the better they do. And the other thing is if you leave them rest, the longer you leave them rest, the higher the risk is of clots, things like that. So most, most of the time now, people's hospital stay is pretty short. They're out in a couple of days and they're normally in to see us in a week. This is another hip replacement. She, at this point, is about six to eight weeks post-op. So she's almost gotten rid of her limp. You can see it just slightly, but it's almost gone. Is this a new procedure? Sorry? Is that a new procedure? Five years ago, we're doing this. Uh, five years ago they would be in hospital a little longer and when they were still doing, five years ago you'd still see wired replacements come in and wired replacements will have a longer scar. 
So we do a lot of scar management where if the scar is irritable and sore, we'll do a lot of work to loosen the scar up. And that's one of the big factors when you're really tender in a scar and you're sitting side saddle on your seat, when you walk you feel the stretch, stretch in the scar and that's what normally starts them with the limp. Partly that, they don't want to stretch it and partly when you replace a hip, every time you move every joint in your body you have little receptors called proprioceptors and the proprioceptors detect the movement. When you have a hip replacement, you don't have those receptors anymore. So you're now relying on muscle length receptors to tell us the limb is doing different things. So it's, it's weird feedback. And so when you're walking and you don't get that feedback mechanism, the body gets confused. And so that's another contributing factor as to why you get the limbs. This is a third one. It's actually flipped over. This is someone that's not operative. So she has a hip injury and her surgeon sent her to us to see if we could improve the walking patterns and avoid surgery. So at this stage she's a wait and see and we see what she um, ends up like. And she's actually doing well at this point and at this point uh, surgery has been indefinitely um, postponed. So that's some hips for you. This is the knee. Once again, lots of muscles, quite complex. Once again, with, just with the backlight, you can't see the knees on the right very well. The knee on the left is a normal knee. And what you see in knees when they degenerate is these spaces here. So that's normal. Can you see on the right what these ones look like? So that's a degenerative knee from osteoarthritis. So this lady had these done. This is one of those crazy cases. She had perfect health, never had an injury at all, went on a cruise ship and got food poisoning. Food poisoning t uh, triggered an autoimmune response that caused rheumatoid arthritis to develop. It aggressively attacked her knees, her shoulder and her back. I just saw this lady this morning, she's three weeks post having her shoulder replaced. So we had the rheumatologist involved, the two different surgeons involved, us and her GP. And the plan was do both knees at one time because they were both terrible. And it sounds harsh having someone have two knees done, it's actually faster rehab because they can't develop a knee limp because they limp on both. So you can actually get them back to normal more quickly because they have to. So she had her, sorry, did someone? Was this triggered all from food poisoning? All from food poisoning. When we first saw her, her husband has been a patient of mine for 12 years and he brought her in and she was in tears about how bad she was and I said, what, what's the biggest thing that you're complaining of? What's the, what's the worst thing at the moment? She went, my knees. No one had looked at her knees because they were just focusing on all the other bits and pieces. So we got MRs done and x-rays and then sent it back to the GP and one of the knee surgeons I work with and they went, yeah, we should definitely address the knees. With the knees being addressed, her back pain is now gone because she's not hobbling. And she had her shoulder done three weeks ago and she's actually more upset about the shoulder being done than the knees because she's been doing this for the last three weeks. And the surgeon won't let her come out of the shoulder sling for another three weeks. So she's trying to get everyone to allow her to come out of this shoulder sling. But shoulders are actually more painful to get operated on than knees and hips. So this is the stages of degeneration. This is what I was trying to say before, degeneration. This is a normal knee. Osteoarthritis, the, that cartilage on the end of the, the bone has just slowly disappeared and eroded. And so you get bone on bone scraping. But rheumatoid eats the joint. It's like someone's got a hole punch and punched holes out of the end of the bone. That's what they often look like on a scan. Rheumatoid is generally more painful and rheumatoid often causes the finger and toe deformities where they splay out sideways a lot, a lot and they get red and hot and swollen. It's really quite a horrific complaint. So these are some knee replacements. Once again, a bit of an icky one on the right. That's what they look like on an x-ray. That's what they look like in real life. This is not a surgery that you observe for your first time in theatre. 
It's fairly brutal. There's big chisels, power chisels. There's bits and pieces of bone and blood, and muck goes everywhere. So they're always funny when we see students come in, because I observe with a couple of the surgeons in theatre quite a lot. When students come in for their first experience, knees are often the ones that make them pass out and fall over. And the irony is, because they're students, they don't want to admit that they don't feel very well, so they won't go and sit down. <laughs> so they invariably fall over and hit things. And then no one will touch them, because when you're in theatre and you're scrubbed in, you can't touch anything on the floor because then you won't be sterile. So you have to leave the room. So they get left there until they come around and then they get an orderly to come in and drag them out by the legs. <laughs> this is pretty funny. We had a guy that actually headbutted one of the surgeons on the back of the leg as he went down. He headbutted a bench and then headbutted the surgeon's knee. And I won't say what the surgeon said because he swears a lot. <laughs> but he asked what he was something or other doing. <laughs> and then he's lying there with his eyes like this. And then the orderly came in and dragged him out and then he was told he wasn't allowed to come back into the theatre again because he wasn't smart enough to actually volunteer that he was going to pass out. This one, you can't really see it and it's not something that is a common injury in retirees but it's an ACL rupture. So the cruciate ligament, anterior cruciate, is much more commonly the ligament of choice to, to injure in sports people. And that white space there shouldn't be there. So that black line should go all the way to there. So this is a soccer player. These are the menisci. Once again, injured fairly commonly in soccer players. And they're a very common injury to come in to see us with knee pain, ongoing knee pain that hasn't settled down. So there's all sorts of different tears of the menisci. And the reason that menisci are a problem is that the inside edge here doesn't really have much blood supply. The outside edge does. So if you don't have good blood supply, you don't really heal very well. So when you have tears in the inside of the menisci, they'll often lock up and jam the joint, and you can't move it. But then there's no point really stitching them up because they won't actually heal anyway. Most of the people here will have minor meniscal tears. So it's one of those injuries is as we age, we tend to get fraying and degeneration in the menisci. So everyone here will probably have a degree of a meniscal tear. So just because you have a meniscal tear doesn't mean that you have to have knee pain. So often these injuries that get diagnosed are not necessarily a problem unless they're correlated with the symptoms or presentation that you have. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but say disc complaints, and we'll do a little bit of stuff on discs as well. If we went out to the street here and got the next hundred cars that drove past and did an MRI or a CT on all of them, about 40% would have a disc bulge that they were unaware of. So unless that disc bulge correlates exactly with where they have the pain, it's irrelevant. These are a couple of knee MRs. Nothing really exciting on those ones, just showing you the different sorts of scans and things. The reason one's white and one's black, they're different weighting. So the one on the left shows bone detail better, the one on the right shows soft tissue detail better. So back pain. As I mentioned before, 80% of the population suffer back pain at some point in their lives. Most people that come in with back pain are looking for the significant event that caused it. They're looking for a car accident or the fall downstairs or someone ran into them. Most back complaints are not from that. Most back complaints are really related to the things that you do every day. So if you sit all day long in front of a computer doing this, you're putting, putting static load on the body, and we weren't really designed to do that. We were really designed to do a multitude of tasks, running around paddocks and chasing our food and gathering our food. And when, when we become more sedentary, we put loads, sustained loads on the body, and it chips away over a period of time. I often use the analogy of chopping down a tree. I suppose a few people here would have chopped down trees in their life. You chop away at the tree with an axe, and those first 700 blows do nothing, but you're slowly gnawing away the tree. And then finally you hit the tree with the last blow of the axe and it falls, falls over. There's nothing different to the last blow and the first blow except the 699 preceding blows that have slowly worn it down. And then it just fails. And so people come in and they were cleaning their teeth and their back went, and they think it's the teeth cleaning. It's nothing to do with that. It's to do with everything they've done beforehand. 
Back pain is recurrent. Most people that have back pain don't get rid of it. And that's normally because either they've got pathology that hasn't or can't be addressed, they keep doing the same things that caused the problem in the first place, or they have weaknesses and imbalances in their system that they need to address and don't. And I would say that for us in our clinic, we can tell people exactly what they need to do so that they never need us again. And when we can say that with complete confidence of not destroying our practice because the amount of people that are compliant enough to do what they need to do to resolve their problems isn't big enough. So the only people that are really compliant are the athletes. So I work with a whole bunch of Olympic level athletes and international level athletes. You tell them what they need to do and they do it diligently. Most people, they come in with back pain. They come in, we treat them, the back pain either stops or, or drops and then their compliance goes down. So they stop doing what they need to do. So they feel better, but they're not perfect. Well, they're still not completely functional. And so if you leave that dysfunction, it comes back again. So I'd urge anyone here that ends up getting treatment, if you've had back pain and you, you get treatment with some, someone, if they give you exercise and activities, do them diligently. Did you have a question? Surgery should always be a last resort. So I send people out for surgery all the time. We'd probably send people out for surgery on a weekly basis, I'd say. But it's, that's more related to the sort of things that we see. So we get a lot of people sent to us with really nasty stuff. So it's questioning whether we can help them or not, or whether they can conservatively manage the condition or whether it has to be surgical. A lot of the time that people are told they need fusion surgery or, and this is an ignorant opinion as well because I, I don't know what's happening with you. So just bear that in mind. But often it's, say you see a, a surgeon and their tool of intervention is surgery, then for a lot of them that's the strategy that they're going to use. But there might be other tools that you could use beforehand. But a lot of the time people get so focused on their little area that they don't consider those other options. And I, and I would say that's becoming a less prevalent scenario these days where a lot of the surgeons that I deal with send a lot of people to us to try and avoid surgery. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes if conservative management has been exhausted, then fusion can be a, a, a very um, useful tool. So if it's degenerative, some degenerative cases actually respond really well to conservative management. Some don't. They're actually more unpredictable. So if you have a disc complaint comes in, someone has a big disc bulge or prolapse and, it, and it's compressing a nerve root and they're getting leg symptoms. They are pretty predictable in their response and about 80% will resolve without the requirement for surgery and their outcomes at the five year mark equal surgical intervention. So if you can manage them that way, you do. When you look at degenerative stenotic backs, what I'll call stenotic, their neurological symptoms are less defined and some of the tests you'd use to identify them actually will come up quite okay. But when you look at the scans, they've got really wicked degeneration. So the classic differentiation, you'll get some people with degenerative change, they walk to the letterbox, they're in pain and they've got leg referral, but they can hop on an exercise bike or ride 10 k's down the shop and they get no pain. So that tends to help us uh, differentiate that it's neurological compression. Whereas if it's vascular insufficiency in the legs, then if they walk, walk to the letterbox, they're in pain. But if they try to ride down the shops, they're still in pain because the muscles are starving for oxygen. So stenotic ones are, are somewhat unpredictable. Some of them go really well without surgery. Some of them don't. And often what you're looking at with those cases is how long can you manage them for conservatively? Because you'll keep degenerating. How long can you manage them conservatively before they may need surgery? And sometimes that gives people the time that they need. I complained before about the fact that lack of exercise is a major factor. 
for most of our diseases. It's a big factor for back pain. Most of the chronic pain cases that I see, and you see people that come in, they've had 10, 20 years of back pain with no resolution. The amount of those that are doing any regular exercise approaches zero. Most of them aren't doing anything. And some of them, which sounds funny, but some of them have retracted away from everything. They don't work, they don't do any exercise, they don't do any home chores. All their activities of daily living have been passed off to other people. And often they get so sensitive that something that they used to be able to do without any pain or complaint at all will now cause them pain. So that reinforces at the central nervous system level that that's bad for the body. So the next time they do it, their body's already attuned to the fact that that's negative and so they experience pain from it. And it's a downhill slide. And often with those people, we had a girl, she was 50 kilos overweight and did nothing. No work, no home duties, no chores, didn't do any exercise, and her exercise program was walk for one minute, twice a day. Now you sit there going, a minute, what's the point? A minute, twice a day, and then week two, two minutes, twice a day. And week three, three minutes, twice a day. At the end of the year, she'd lost 30 kilos. She was now at 45 minute walk, twice a day. And the difference between where she was at and where she currently is, it's a whole world apart. When you talk to people about that kind of level of progression, and that's an extreme case, but one year they go, well, I don't want to spend a year getting back to normal. You've been like this for 20 years. We're not magicians. And it's got to be methodical and consistent. And so she's now back into to work again. She's doing all her home duties and things. And she's doing just fine. This is the lumbar spine. The spine is quite a fascinating, our whole bodies are really fascinating in fact. At each segment, at each level, we have five lumbar vertebrae, 12 thoracic and seven cervical. Unless you're a little abnormal where you might have a couple of extra segments thrown in there somewhere. Every single segment can rotate, it can flex forward and backwards, it can tip side to side, and it can also translate up and down a little bit. So when you look at even flexion, it's not just one hinge. You've essentially got at least the lumbar and the thoracic 17 segments contributing to that, plus your hips are moving. I'm always fascinated when I look at pictures like this because of the complexity of what our spines and bodies do. On the right, this is all the nerve roots that come out when people complain about sciatic nerve pain or sciatica. This is a sciatic nerve, so it's basically coming from the two or three last segments of the spine and it passes through your glutes and goes down in your leg. Sciatic pain or um, sciatica is an irritation of that nerve probably makes up the greater proportion of low back complaints because most low back degenerative conditions happen at L4 and L5 level. So the two bottom segments are the ones that tend to pick up most of the load. So the one on the left is a relatively normal x-ray, the one on the right is a relatively abnormal x-ray. So this, this is a degenerative spine from someone that is in their late 50s. They've got what I said before about unless you've got some extra segments. On the left side, and I don't know if it's clear enough here, but that should look like that. So you can see that's a little projection by itself in isolation. You can see this one started to fuse to the pelvis. So that's a, a congenital complaint. That's been there her whole life. So she came in with that complaint and she was told it was because of this fusion. But why didn't that hurt for the 50 years preceding that? It's been there since she was born. These are some screws and things just to show you some of the surgery we see in low back. This is one way that they do fusion surgery. So on the left you can see there's not much space in between the discs. This is a pretty good looking disc. And then this is what they did to resolve the person. So three big screws and a couple of rods and they stretch the joint back out again. So instead of them sitting on top of each other and irritating all the nerves, they give them more space. How much would that mobility uh, Not very much at all, in fact. Each segment, I'll, I'll answer you in a second. Each segment will only move around about three to five degrees. So when you put two segments on top of each other and fuse them both, they will remove your range of motion to a degree, but it's only 
six, seven percent. Because often when you look at your flexion, a lot of it is actually coming from your hips. So I can keep my back perfectly straight and lean forward this far and my back has not moved. That's all hip joint contributing to the flexion. So when you see these fusion surgeries, you can often examine them. If you didn't know they were fused, you wouldn't actually pick it up when you were watching them. Because that you're only talking this much of the spine, you barely see it move. And really, when we get older, we lose a lot of our movement anyway. So you get you know, person A who's 65 and can only move this far anyway. And then person B comes in and they've had a double fusion and they've got more range. So it, it doesn't actually restrict your movement very much. Most people won't actually feel the change in range of motion. Yes, is that called a bridge that they build up and put the spaces in? Uh, they, they could call it a bridge. And then is it true that on top of that it weakens the joints on top of it? Yep, it puts more load on the joints above and below. That's what I said before about surgery is always the last resort. We get cases that come in and there is no option. It's going to be surgical and there's no way other than surgery. We had a girl come in a couple of weeks ago and it's one of those terrible cases that she just got, she saw a whole bunch of people and they missed what was wrong. I've actually got a picture of her, I think. Yes, this is her. On the left is a normal MRI. So this white or kind of light grey line, this is the fluid around the spinal cord. So when you get into the real low back, right down low, it's not, a spinal cord is not a tube by that point, it's like a horse's tail, it's a whole bunch of individual fibres. And so it's surrounded by this fluid filled sac called the thecal sac. Now we should see this nice big white line and you can see this nice big white line there and then it all disappears. So this is a disc bulge You'll often see disc bulge that'll just be this space, but you can see her disc bulge is pushing all the way up almost to the next vertebral level. So when she came in, she couldn't stand on her toes at all, and she had no reflexes in her heel at all, and she walked like this. If that was not decompressed, so she had essentially a week and a half to get back on her toes, and if she wasn't on her toes in a week and a half, surgical emergency. Because if she's left like that for an extended period of time, it, the nerves die off. It's called Wallerian degeneration. The nerves will die off and you don't ever get it back. So for, for those cases, we have a time limited strategy. If they don't, don't get right by X time frame, then they have to go surgical. Now when you look at the degenerative cases, most of the time the compression comes on over a longer period of time and they don't get those hard neuro losses. So if you haven't lost the ability to get on your toes and you haven't got numbness or loss of bowel and bladder function, then it's not a surgical emergency. And that's when you explore every conservative management strategy you can to avoid that. Sometimes fusions are necessary, often they're not. So we'll often deal with people who've had surgery and it hasn't gone well. So they come in, you know, if they've gone really well, they might be in to see us for rehab, but they sometimes will show up because they're worse after surgery than they were when they went in, unfortunately. Hydrotherapy can be great because, you know, it's, it's partly non-weight bearing, you're floating around in the water, you're strengthening yourself, and hypothetically when you progress beyond hydrotherapy, you should be doing more active exercise and activity to continue to strengthen yourself. Good. Good. That's awesome. That's good. The other thing is with these sorts of fusions, there's actually different sorts of fusions as well. So these really big gross fusions, you don't see as much anymore. So they'll often use little cages now and they're actually made out of carbon fibre and they insert those in between the vertebral bodies and it'll create space, but they don't do the multi-level ones unless they need to. So this is the one on the top is another disc bulge and then the one down here is a degenerative spine. 
And so you can see on this one, all the vertebrae, the discs have disappeared and the, the vertebral bodies are just sitting on top of each other. So if you imagine at the, uh, where the nerve roots come out of the spine, there's little holes called foramen. And they're formed by basically an arch above and below from the vertebrae above and below. So if you lose space between the vertebrae, then that hole shuts down and that compresses the nerve. And that's often why they're doing uh, fusions. So the neck. Neck complaints are not as common as back complaints. Sorry, do you have a question? Neck complaints are not as common as back complaints. And neck complaints are not as easy to manage as back complaints because their response to surgery is much more unpredictable and their response to conservative management is much more unpredictable. But if we examine everyone here, we'd probably find that only a few of you would have a very good range of motion in the neck. So we mostly lose our rotational range as we age. But a lot of the time people won't complain about that. So it's a little stiff and you might have to turn around doing this, but it doesn't hurt. The one on the right is once again a whole bunch of disc bulges. And in this one you can see really clearly how we have the, the two white lines at the front and the back. And at this point in the spine, the spinal cord is a solid tube. And then in this area you can see no white at all. So that's significant spinal cord compression. Now this person actually didn't need surgery. So even though it's really significant compression, they actually settle down without surgery and no peripheral symptoms at all. This is a neck fusion. This is one from many years ago. A uh, person had an accident uh, on a flying fox when they were in their late teens, or early 20s and they had bil bilateral fusion. And what you'll often see with these ones over a long period of time, because the neck has more range of motion, they'll often then get more problems above and below. This is just another look at a, an MRI where you can see in this one the spinal cord and the big white space all around it. And in this one you can see the big disc bulge that's basically taking away all the space on that left hand side. This is our clinic. Uh, we're at Carina. We've got a lot of equipment that we use with people in rehab and a lot of it ends up being in quite tough love because the more active you can get people, the better they tend to do. So we use things like um, cages. If people are unstable, we treat people with MS and stroke rehab. And if we want them lifting weights, we'll put them in a cage. They can't fall over with the weights. They can't drop weights on themselves. But we get them moving. We try and move the segments as much as we can. Uh, this is what I said before about doing the video guided um, gait stuff so people can see what they're doing. We do a lot of sports testing on these machines as well. And this is just, actually this is me using some of our equipment. So we have some machines that we specifically use for post knee and hip uh, <coughs> surgery where you're doing rehab on trying to get segmental control over a joint. And you want to be careful in gym environments what equipment you use because not all gym equipment is particularly good to use to post op. So we have really specific machines for specific body parts. So the services we provide, we've got chiro, acupuncture, uh, sports massage, general massage, sports testing, rehab, exercise science. We do a lot of gym programs and things as well for people with strokes and back complaints and things. So often we'll be designing programs that they'll be using at their own gym or where they're going by themselves. And there's a whole range of different things we can treat. Um, I've got some other videos of stuff in the clinic that I can show you, but just, just to make sure we don't run out of time, is there questions and things that you specifically want answered today? I have a question. I have a question for the microphone. Um, you said not many people reach a normal level of fitness. What, how you, what is the time as a normal level of fitness for various age groups? Oh, that's probably about the hardest question you could possibly ask. <laughs> There's not actually a particularly great definition for what fitness is. So fitness would be made up of a range of different factors over cardiovascular fitness and flexibility and strength that in totality would give you an idea of whether people were fit or not. 
When you look, you look at a lot of the quantitative tests, there's age scores that we expect people to get to. And some of the simple things that we would test with people on a, on a regular basis, say standing on one leg, the young reference group, you should be able to stand on one leg with your eyes open for 30 seconds plus. When you close your eyes, that time frame reduces to 10 seconds. So we want to see people able to stand like this for 10 seconds. When you're less than those benchmarks, your likelihood of getting problems increases. So if you have balance issues, obviously you're going to be a fall risk or a trip risk. Most people, as they age, will do less exercise and activity. And there's actually some suggestions in research in the States that the re reason, a lot of people would know the old equation that 220 minus age is our maximum heart rate. Now, some research suggests that the only reason that we have that correlation is that as we age, we don't push ourselves to maximum as often. And there was a fellow in the States, I think it was um, Wilmore, I can't think of his first name, but he had a theory that if he kept training people at Redline, that their maximum heart rate would not reduce. And he proved it. So he had this whole bunch of people and they all trained at maximum all the time. And <coughs> the irony is, if you train regularly, cardiovascular exercise is protective for strokes and heart disease, but instantaneously when you're doing the exercise, your risk is higher at the time. So he proved that if you kept people training for the 20 years at maximum heart rate, they never dropped. But then he died of a heart attack. <laughs> so, so it was unfortunate, but he, he actually proved the point. So did that kind of answer the question? <laughs> no? <laughs> you, you can, if you're not doing, realistically, everyone here, irrespective of age, should really be doing about four or five sessions of exercise for about 30 to 40 minutes per session per week. If you're not at that baseline level, if we test you, you're going to fail benchmarks. But if you are at that level consistently, you're more liable to go over those benchmarks. So every test, if we did a stress test, we would have benchmarks for your age that we should see and we can get a rating for it. But as far as can I give you a test that you could go and do by yourself that would allow you to know whether you're fit or not? <laughs> flu or cold? cold. Man, man flu or...? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> when, when you have an illness, your body needs rest. So some people suggest an illness is an indicator that your body is not coping well. well. And so you should rest somewhat when you have a cold or a flu. Yeah. But when you get over it, get back into it again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that one. Um, I've got two questions. Okay. The first one is, you mentioned the food poisoning, that was, was very healthy. Uh -huh. I'm not sure you up with. Uh, can someone uh, end up with pains and anxiety from stress and anxiety as well? Being well, could that cause a similar effect as uh, uh, getting in food poisoning? When you look at autoimmune diseases, they can be triggered by any major stress to the body. So food poisoning causes obviously digestive stress and then that triggers a response. You'll get people that you'd call them chronic pain syndromes, people that are, they're, they're overly sensitive and they have pain when it doesn't really make sense. And they're sometimes diagnosed as fibromyalgia. Now fibromyalgia is, some people believe it as a diagnosis, some people don't believe it as a diagnosis. But what you do know with anyone that has been classified as fibromyalgia, they will definitely be hypersensitive. So input to them will often be considered as noxious and painful, whereas that input to the person next to them would be wiped off and eliminated. Any time you get those cases, if you dig deep enough, it will have been triggered by a stressful event. And it might have been you know, a divorce 
or a death or a car accident or some big insult to the body on either the emotional or physical level will trigger that event. And then when they get into that cycle, getting them out of it is tricky. And that's what I was talking with that overweight girl before, was that methodology of finding out what is her threshold for activity that will cause her to react and then coming in underneath that with an intervention strategy that she can get away with five minutes of cleaning the shower and she doesn't get pain. So every day she's got to clean the shower for five minutes. Instead of doing all of it in one hit, she, she causes a reaction, then she's in pain. So yes, stress can definitely cause those events. The second question is that, uh, sorry, the second question, I personally Thank you. And do you have, and this will make everyone laugh, hopefully, uh, do you have any special, uh, if you come and see me uh, from this um, presentation, what? because none of us here properly are aware of the fees, and I'm asking this personally. Yeah, we would always give seniors a discount anyway. And we could certainly work out a discount for people at this presentation today. So we actually have a lot of associations with um, running groups and gyms and different associations of different groups that we work with that we give them a discount. And I'd be quite happy to give you guys a discount for today. I've got some cards and details of our clinic over here, so I brought some along just in case any, anyone want further details. Yeah. I'll answer this one first because you hand up. Years ago I had a hip problem. My GP would come with a coastline uh -huh. and I'd have the GP look at me and say, Have you got any pain? Yeah. And I'd say, Yeah, I do. So I'd have a full hip replacement, about 4 years ago. And they said, Well, you've got a hip replacement, about 4 years ago. So, about 4 years ago. And uh, no problem since. But I never had to go through all that uh, walking and stresses. Okay. So, but, but, it's another tough question. One of the knee surgeons that we deal with a lot, I've had three knee ops in the last three years. I'd trash my knee running. <laughs> Not really a good advertisement for exercise being good for you. But uh, the surgeon is a, a good friend of mine. We deal with people all the time. I said, what do you think with the whole glucosamine argument? There is a, there's a number of studies in the literature that suggest that glucosamine can be very beneficial for people's joints. Not everyone seems to respond to it though. So the things that have um, research to support fish oils, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, MSN, gelatin, D3 and silica have all uh, shown links that would suggest that they will help joint health. So you get some people, you pull, you put them on glucosamine chondroitin supplements and they just seem to do fantastically. And then you get other people and they seem to do nothing. I often suggest to people that if they're going to start using those products, keep a diary. And, and for the first two months, double the dose, so you get a loading dose, so that the body builds, and then stay on it for six months, keeping a diary of how they feel, and then stop taking it, and then keep a diary of how they feel. And what you'll often find is as things build up, people go, ah, oh, I didn't really do anything. And then they stop taking it, and then six months later they go, oh, my back pain's back again, and my knees are sore again, and whatnot. You're like, well, have you been taking your glucosamine? Oh, no, I stopped that. How was it when you were taking glucosamine? Oh, Pretty good actually. So can when we see a direct causal, you start taking glucosamine and a week later you're better? No. And if you start taking glucosamine in one week your knees are perfect, it's probably actually a placebo. It's probably not actually related to the medication at all. Sorry? So it probably wasn't going to have an impact on you. So I often say to people they've they've been taking it for ages and then you say to them, Well, do you notice any difference? No. Well, stop taking it. It's an expensive supplement. So if it's not having an impact, I think it's probably a good idea to get off it. Yeah. And not, you, you get some people, what you said about not doing anything post-op, you get some people that get away with it. Awesome. You get other people that don't. But when they come back down the track and they've been hobbling for two years and they've got problems, it's much harder to unwind them then because they've learnt to do this for two years and when you're trying to stop them from doing it, then they're like, oh yeah, am I still doing it? You're like, mm, a little. <laughs> so it can be a 
battle. Land this one first. You've got something on that for a bunch of there. Yep. Can you give us a quick little burst on that? Because it's a bit of mystery. The acupuncturist that we have working with us, I've worked with him for about 12 or 14 years. He started off as a remedial massage therapist, then did a degree in acupuncture, then did, uh, went over to China and did some work over there. Acupuncture has been used in Chinese healthcare for around about 3,000 years. And the theory on acupuncture is that you're affecting energy meridians in the body that then change the way the feedback mechanisms work. So it's upregulation, I suppose you'd say. Some people respond incredibly to acupuncture. And when you look at China, they have acupuncture in the mainstream hospital system. So they'll often use acupuncture for anaesthetic reasons, um, for surgery and all sorts of interesting things. In Western society, our use of acupuncture is less and our medical system is very skeptical about it. But you see some fantastic results from acupuncture. And what I'd say is, we're in an era, and I was giving the students a bollocksing about this on Tuesday, Wednesday at the med school, we're in an era that we believe that we know so much and that we've progressed so far with research that everything we're doing is, is top notch. And we look at things that don't, don't have evidence as hogwash and they shouldn't be done. 50 years ago, we thought that thalidomide was a fantastic idea, and that turned out to be a, a big spoiler. It was a stupid idea. But at the time, it came out and there was research behind it. But they hadn't researched all the profound negative impacts that it would have on people. So what I say with evidence-based is evidence-based care, which is the big spruik at the moment, dictates what we shouldn't do, what's proven to be dangerous, what's proven not to work under any circumstances. But it doesn't dictate what we should do. And what we, if we're at the cutting edge of research, then we're 10 to 15 years ahead of evidence-based. So just because we can't find good evidence for acupuncture at the moment doesn't mean that in 10 or 20 years we will have good evidence for it. And we'll look back in 50 years at what we're doing now and go, oh, I can't believe we did that, because it was really stupid idea. Yeah. Does, does that give you a, yeah. enough? Yeah. The question I was going to ask is, with people with heart problems or diabetes, yep. diabetes, when you create a cardiologist and that, they all recommend that you do walking or exercise um, on a regular basis. Yep. Now, in your estimation of the sports method, do people use the walk three to four times a week for a half an hour? Is that classified as uh, enough exercise for that, those sort of complaints? For heart complaints? For heart or diabetes. Now, most of us say you've got to exercise every day and all that. Now, you talk about uh, sports or football or any of those things, a lot of them have done training on that regular basis. Now, you're saying that you've got to do that for three to four times a week. Yeah. Is that one or two days? Three times is probably not as much as you should be. Four to five times would be better. If you're doing half an hour, what stops you doing an extra 15 minutes to get to 45 minutes or so? Yeah, no, I'm just, no, I'm not, I'm just saying that they recommend in the book. That's all I'm saying. That in their booklet, they say at least a half an hour walking, um, you know, uh, three to four times uh, a week. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, uh, yeah, you can walk for 45, some people walk an hour, but I'm just saying the requirement is um, in your program there. Um, do you recommend in your advice to people? That they should do seven days a week or six days? Never seven days a week. The higher the intensity of the exercise, the more rest time you need. So with all the elite level athletes, they all have rest days. And so there's days when they're doing nothing, they're basically kicking back watching movies and doing nothing. And that, that's at the international level. The longer, when you look at, there was an interview years ago and Thorpe was talking about the fact that he had two weeks holiday after the Olympics. And one of the the reporters were saying, oh, is that all the time you're going to have off? 
they lose so much form in two weeks that it takes them like six weeks to build that up. So they don't want to take a four or six week break because it's three months minimum then before they'd be back at, at competition level. When you're really high intensity, you have to have at least one rest day, if not two rest days a week. And when you look at their tro uh, the training programs, it's called periodisation. They have hard days and medium days and, and um, low intensity days, and then in total rest days. And it's a, a mix up, because you don't keep them at peak the whole time, because they fail. When you're looking at um, rehab for, uh, or cardiovascular recovery, we have this, and I, I'm probably a little facetious about it, but we have a, a, a more sedentary society who are trying to do less and less. And our weight problems in society, about 60% of adults are now overweight or obese. Statistically, only 30% of the males and 50% of the females see themselves that way. So even though most of us are overweight, most people think they're not, which is a bit of a shocker. So we're very concerned about things like um, bulimia and, and all the anorexia and all the nasty eating disorders, but they actually make up a very small percent of the, a percentage. The mortality rate from them is very low and the impact on other health concerns isn't actually very high, but excess weight is. And we seem to have this, I'll call it a defeatist, attitude that people don't really want to exercise so we're trying to strip back what we want them to do to be less and less because we think that oh maybe at least they'll do half an hour but when we look at the physiology of the body 45 minutes is optimum time spent for gains made for activity so if you do 45 minutes it tends to stimulate your physiology and metabolism to work for a period of time but if you're only doing 20 minutes it's like and it drops so as I said before, if you're doing 30 minutes, put another 15 minutes onto it, and the effects of that will be quite profound. Does that answer that question well? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've only got time for one more uh, question. Okay. So, uh, because we have to get out of here by 12. So we'll finish up with Kevin and then. Okay. Just a couple of comments. We're back with Muncher. Yeah. Went to the water first. Massage in my entire life when I was about uh, 65. Yeah. And, and I had a couple of broken arms and all that sort of thing. And uh, in three or four sessions, took away couples that I've had for years. So although I still don't really believe in that much, I think it works. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, you can see some really profound things that occur. So. Yeah, you see some really profound impacts at times and sometimes you treat things and you think, oh, I don't think this is going to do any good and then the person feels amazingly better. And it's, I don't do acupuncture myself, but yeah, you see some amazing things. So it's interesting, the good thing about people like you, when people don't believe in it, but it makes them better, you go, well, it's definitely not going to be in their head. <laughs> <laughs> so would you have acupuncture yourself? I do. We kind of torture each other a fair bit, so we've got a really good team of guys and staff that work together, and I've worked in multidisciplinary clinics for years, so I'm lucky to have a whole bunch of, I treat a whole bunch of surgeons and GPs and a whole range of different health practitioners. We tend to prostitute our services to each other a fair bit, so a lot of trading and, and whatnot. So if I have some, something wrong, then the acupuncturist that works for us will often badger me and say, well, you really need to get this done. So yes, I do, I do get it done myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed John's presentation. And I hope you've all learned something today. If you have uh, some questions that you'd like to ask John, perhaps, is, is that all right, John? And perhaps you could come and see John while some of us gather up the chairs so that we can reorganise the
I never had surgery. But I did read the surgery in the first place. I said, look, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm not believing it could be cured. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, but um, I just can't make that appointment and I'll bring you back uh, to, to uh, you know, make another appointment. And it is. Thanks Thank for your you attention. Thank you. And thanks for your attention today. Appreciate it.